Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Nicole Quinn, and I'm here with Dr. Brenda Roud, who's my friend and colleague and the co-host of the Immunology Podcast. Welcome to the Lab Coats and Life Podcast, where we help scientists thrive. The Lab Coats and Life Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life sciences research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. If you enjoy the Lab Coats and Life Podcast, rate us and leave us a review. You can also suggest ideas or recommend guests for new episodes. Today, we have Dr. Jennifer Polk, who says we can call her Jen, on the podcast. She has been blogging and providing advice via phdtolife.com for more than 10 years. She'll talk about her experience working as an academic and a career coach for graduate students and PhDs. We are going to address the question, to postdoc or not to postdoc? But before we get into that... Are you enjoying listening to the Lab Coats and Life podcast? Are there other soft skills, topics, or questions about your life in a lab coat that you'd like to learn more about? Visit www.stemcell.com slash suggest topics to tell us what you're passionate about, and we will endeavor to cover it via Stem Cell Technologies mentorship resources. So welcome, Jen. Uh, thank you so much, so much for joining us for uh, this first edition of our podcast. As a postdoc myself, I'm very interested in what you're uh, going to talk to us about today. I think it would be nice to start off giving our listeners a little bit of background about the work you do. And let's maybe start addressing uh, by addressing the elephant in the room. So most of our listeners, I assume all of our listeners, are um, uh, PhDs or uh, researchers in uh, STEM discipline. You are originally from non-STEM field, but you are indeed um, helping uh, STEM researchers, you know, advance their careers. So I was thinking about when I, when I, when I realized this, I think that this might actually be a good thing. Uh, and I'm really interested in hearing the kind of work that you do and how your experience has been uh, discussing career uh, choices, career issues with STEM scientists. Yeah, for sure. Thanks so much for having me, folks. And I'm happy to be the elephant in this podcast room. <laughs> Everyone likes elephants, right? Let me first let me first try this like brand new intro on you. And then yeah, happy to talk background. Uh and Jen, yes, is the correct feel free to call me Jen, folks. Um, so I I call myself the go-to career clarity coach for underappreciated professors, postdocs, and other PhDs who are done compromising their values and priorities, chasing prestige or a paycheck. And I teach them to get crystal clear on what they want to do and how to communicate their values so they can land great fit jobs that let them live where they want, get paid well, and do meaningful work with awesome colleagues. So what you have here between Brenda and I are two people who have chosen the opposite ends of that to postdoc or no, not to postdoc question. So I chose the not to postdoc route. Um, I did a PhD in, in molecular biology and biochemistry here in Vancouver at Simon Fraser University. And then I was very much on the academic train. I I had a postdoc opportunity lined up and ultimately at the sort of 11th hour decided not to pursue it and came to stem cell. That was 11 and a half years ago. And I have grown my career here as a science communicator and, and leading some of the marketing department since. And, and it was the right decision for me. We can get into why and how and all of that stuff later if we want. But um, just to sort of set the stage, Brenda has gone she chose the opposite end of that, that to postdoc or not to postdoc question. So Brenda, maybe you can introduce sort of where you are in your career. And then that kind of sets the stage for what, what Jennifer's talking to us about. And we can kind of address some things, um, some big questions that people tend to have. Yeah. So I, uh, I'm originally from Argentina. So I moved across the pond for a PhD in immunology in Germany uh, and, and, Hanover in the north of Germany, beautiful weather, just kidding. Um, <laughs> and I, so I graduated about five years ago and I did uh, move to, now I'm living in the Netherlands. I moved here for my postdoc. I was postdoctoral researcher at the Netherlands, Netherlands Cancer Institute here in Amsterdam for almost four years. 
And now I'm on my second position in a different institute also within um, Amsterdam. So, uh, and I've been there for roughly 10 months. So this is my second postdoc, so I'm committed. So Jennifer, why don't you give us your quick background and, and maybe we can start by just asking like, what is a postdoc? What does, what does it do? What is the intent? I don't know if you know any history. Um, and what generally do you encounter when people are, are asking you this question? Yeah, awesome. Thanks for sharing, folks. Uh, so um, my personal background is I did a PhD in history uh, and I finished back in 2012, which is some years ago now. And in it's it's changing a little bit, but generally speaking, in a humanities field, and history is one of those humanities fields, you don't do a postdoc. You don't have to do a postdoc to get a faculty position. There are postdocs. There's different kinds of postdocs. You can do a postdoc. It's not going to hurt you. Um, but it's it's quite. I say that because, of course, I have learned over the past decade in this new career of mine as a career coach that in a lot of fields in STEM, especially, a postdoc is kind of a requirement if you are hoping on continuing in an academic career. Um, and that, I'm laughing, like that's so strange to me coming from a humanities background. So just to say like, there are differences even within academia here. Uh, but yes, I, I do recognize that it's often considered a requirement. I think that um, the challenge, though, is this this knowledge that a postdoc is kind of like the default next step for an academic career trajectory. Folks forget that second part of it, that they they assume that it is the default next step for a career in science or any kind of career that after your PhD, you got to do a postdoc. And that's where I like elephant in and say, uh, uh, what it depends on what you want to do. Because we got two folks here, like Nicole, you're a perfect example of somebody who probably has a whiz bang scientific career, right? <laughs> I think we could say. And you didn't do a postdoc at all. And it probably didn't hurt you. No, it didn't. It didn't hurt me. No, I, I don't do any research anymore. Um, but I do use my scientific knowledge and, and specifically the knowledge that I gained just as a, through my experience going through the academic system. Now, I don't know if doing a postdoc would have added to that at that point. Um, I, I don't think it would have. It's interesting. In terms of the history, this, I'm going to get this wrong, but I feel like, you know, the Americans just like made up postdocs in the seventies when they had like extra money for military research and they just created it for all the extra physicists. Uh, you know, it's not like this is some, uh, it's it's not a given down from the heavens, right? That postdocs are like the thing that you must do. They just made it up some decades ago. Yeah, I, I feel that way too. I've, I, I've sometimes equated it to a residency in medical school, but I don't think that's quite right because that's, that's required. Like that's part of your training. Um, whereas a postdoc is kind of like, kind of random feeling. It's like, it's, it, you're right. It's like that no man's land between, between, um, between your, your official training and then your, whatever you're going to do next. I would add from my limited experience as a postdoc and my, uh, kind of exposure to the academic field around me, I, I sometimes I think of a postdoc Try not to be too cynical about it because sometimes I think seeing it as a no man's land, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit demotivating for those of us who are standing in that no man's land. Sorry, I, sorry, I, I like. <laughs> no, I, 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 I just, I'm just pulling your leg. But I think the the reason why there's postdocs and not everybody can be faculty in has to do with the availability of faculty positions. So it's like a wait. I would see it more as a maybe a waiting uh, room in which you get ready to be the person closest to the door when the door opens. Uh, maybe something like that. Uh, and I think also in, in a kind of a cynic, slightly more cynical view, it all comes down to money. That's the time as a postdoc that you show uh, that you can get the grants and the institutes want you to get in order to give you a space as part of the faculty. Uh, I, I see like kind of, yes, if you are a self, you can be a self-motivated scientist and you have this plan of what you want to do with your brain and what kind of research you want to do. But I think in the end of the day, if I'm going to be very blunt about it, uh, especially in a field like 
immunology that is extremely expensive to do research, uh, you have to convince other people to fund your ideas. And the only way of doing that is, is showing that you have some kind of track record. And usually the PhD, unless you are a very talented, extremely illuminated kind of a researcher, you probably don't have enough during your PhD. Uh, and, and then you have this second chance at doing what you want with your own, out of your own volition, kind of, with some support from hopefully a, su a supportive PI that will provide the funds for you to show that you know what you're doing. At least that's how I like to see it. Jennifer, do you have anything add, uh, to add about the career path benefits? from doing a postdoc career path benefits can I say something else first yeah 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 go for it go for it there's this real tension in postdocs and I say this as an outsider right somebody who works with postdocs a lot of the time and often helps them get get jobs that aren't postdocs uh, there's this tension between the postdoc as a trainee right the postdoc position a train trainee role uh, and the postdoc as an independent researcher and so I, I, I've heard from PIs, like on Twitter, for example, over the years, like professors will say outright to me sometimes, yeah, a new PhD is not an independent researcher. They're still a trainee and they need that extra training. And, you know, from the humanities perspective, I roll my eyes because like I'm, <laughs> you're independent once you have a PhD. Like, what are we even doing here, folks? But the tension between like, are you a trainee? That's terrible language, by the way, and I blame the big institutions that fund research in North America for continuing to use that language, but that's a rant. And are you a working scientist with a professional job who can like contribute to the scientific enterprise and get grants and, and mentor you know other students, et cetera, et cetera? And that, I think, is very unclear for individuals no, to know ahead of time what exactly the balance between like, am I a trainee or am I a working professional? Like, what's the balance between those things? And I think that that causes trouble. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think Brenda's better to comment on this than I am. But my sense would be that you start kind of on the one end of that spectrum, and you you kind of move to the other end as you're as you progress through your postdoc career. Yeah, definitely. I think there, in my experience or what I, I consider that there is a uh, evol evolution in your skills and your knowledge set. And I also think that in the particular case of the biological sciences, um, the kind of work that you, yeah, you, you can be, I mean, a lot of the thoughts you think of, but then there's so much actual work that has to be done that often requires infrastructure, that requires technicians, that requires, so maybe... Uh, if you work in the in the humanities and then basically you, you need to do a lot of research but I, I would assume and this is from without really knowing that you need to maybe look at uh, read or read uh, books or look at original you know documents and and it's something like in principle you can do with a computer and uh, some mobility and and then it's mostly about your 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 thoughts and how you organize this information that's coming to you or that you're actively searching and I think that in the case of the STEM especially uh, disciplines like uh, yeah bio biomedical research the complexity of the infrastructure that is required is so much so much greater than it's hard to convince someone to fund i mean you can think all that you want but if you don't have you know 50 grants to get get the reagents uh, have the people and find the lab space you're not going to be able to realize your research and i think the then therefore it becomes a lot harder for you to you need to maybe pass as a trainee or have more somebody to vouch for you otherwise who's going to give you 50 grand to just do what comes out of your brain I mean there's some grants that do it and I think it's great but that's usually not the case you really need to fight for those thousands of dollars of euros that you need to do the simplest research there should be more career paths I'm not going to rant but there should be more career paths for all of those different types of roles so that yeah. not everybody is being ostensibly trained for a job that most of them yeah. will never get, not because they suck, but simply they just don't exist. Mm -hmm. And yeah. rant. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But I, I think there are more career paths. And that's where this question comes in is, 
is, and I, and I can certainly say that in the, in the 12 years or so, since I finished my PhD, I've seen more and more career paths kind of pop up. I feel like, or at least come, they, maybe they always existed, but you, you had to find them and they're more prevalent now. They're more easy to recognize. And, um, and some of those may or may not require a postdoc or some of them may benefit or may not benefit. So maybe we can ask you this, Jennifer, if somebody were to come to you and say, should I do a postdoc or not do a postdoc? Or maybe a mentor, like a PI comes to you and says, should I tell my students to do postdocs or not to do postdocs? What are the kind of, where do you start? What are the questions you start with them with or what, how do you, how do you guide them? Yeah. Awesome. So the first thing I say, if I'm being snarky is that's a wrong question. <laughs> <laughs> Cause it's not about whether to postdoc or not to postdoc. I mean, I'm glad you're asking because it means that you're open to the, to the default being wrong, which cool, like well done gold star truly. But the right question is, what do you want to do? Who are you in the world? What's important to you? What difference do you want to make? What do you need in order to thrive? Like all of those questions. So much of the time people are like, okay, I have a PhD in X, what should I do? And they go out and then they, you know, go on LinkedIn and they go on Google and they search for, you know, jobs for PhDs in X field or whatever X is. And that's not wrong, but it's the wrong thing to do first. The first thing you want to do is like, what do you want to do? <laughs> right? And that's always the annoying question, right? Like people are like, what should I do with my PhD in immunology? And then people like me pop up and are like, what do you want to do? answering a question with a question. But really, that's the crucial work. And it's the work that people step, uh, skip, excuse me, they skip this step. Uh, and this step is self-reflection. And then whatever the answer to that question of who, who are you? What do you want to do in the world? What kind of career do you want? Right? All of those self-reflection questions, um, they will lead you to a a picture of the kind of career you want, the next job you want. And then you want to go out and step two here is, okay, what are the positions? What are the career paths that are going to align with me, all of me, not just me as this, like with this person with this degree and with this particular dis dissertation and discipline, whatever, because that's part of you, but all of you, what aligns with you? And then it could be that a postdoc fits in there, but then that's not the end of it because it's about specific opportunities, specific postdoc positions in specific labs, working with specific PIs on specific grants, right? And so I would say that even at the end of step two, if folks have postdoc roles on their list, that they should also consider the possibility that there are other types of roles that aren't postdoc positions uh, that could also be on their list. So it's not, it's really never about should I postdoc or not? It's which is the next best job for me. Mm -hmm. So I'm not, I don't mean to sound like a postdoc hater. I'm not a, a hater of the people and not, I don't mean to be a hater of the position, but there might actually be a different position that gets you closer to doing the work and to being the person, the professional that you want to be right now. That really resonates a lot, I have to say. However, it's always, I would say, uh, like the time around your the, your graduation from your PhD, and I think I, I had this issue, I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. It's so hard to find the mental space to to, to do this kind of introspection, isn't it? I, mean, I, I guess this you find that with a lot of people because that must be the worst time to do this, this work. Uh, and 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 try to figure out what you want because the only thing you want is for it to be done probably at if you are eighty percent of eight of, of of PhD graduates. Um, so I guess that my question would be: Is there more specific? I don't want to say instructions, but how do you go about answering this question? I, that, other other that it's not you know I know getting some 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 uh, herbs and going to the desert and you know getting lost there for five days until it comes to you in a dream yeah I'm laughing 
Yeah, awesome. So there's no one right way of doing this. And the process isn't super scientific. And that might, you know, be annoying for some of your listeners, but maybe n- nice for some of those. I was talking to a scientist the other day who was like, actually, I appreciate that <laughs> this is a more holistic approach. Um, but the kinds of things that, and when I work with folks in my program, uh, and when I do workshops, I kind of do a quick, quick version of this kind of stuff. But what are your values? And this, you know, you don't have to do this endlessly. And you can just like sit down for 10 minutes and make a list out of your own brain, right? You know, this doesn't have to be a whole big thing. It's like, what are your values in life, right? As a person, uh, what are your strengths, uh, right? What are your strengths? What are your skills, right? And and maybe uh, suggesting a couple different ways of thinking about skills can be helpful here. And you remember, you're not just like the person in the lab who does that particular research. You want to think about the whole, all of you in all contexts, right? So what are your skills? We did values, we did strengths, we did skills. Okay, what about priorities? What about goals, right? All of those different kinds of things. And then it's like, well, where do you want to live? How much money do you want to make, right? Like, how do you want to, how much do you want to travel in your job, right? You want to work remotely, like all those kind of nitty gritty details about workplace and work style and the kind of colleagues that you want, et cetera. And then to put this in practical terms, okay, let me, I got, I suggest a couple of exercises. I do this sometimes in workshops, a couple of exercises. The first exercise is to introduce yourself. So the introduction, the introduction we're all used to, you know, in, in science and in academia is like, hi, I'm Brenda. I have a PhD in immunology and I'm currently a postdoc at such and such institute. And my particular expertise is, you know, a whole string of words that I can't undecipher. <laughs> right? Awesome. Cool. Right. And everybody around the table in that institute, like, is nodding and they get it, whatever. So my exercise is, okay, you can't say any of that. <laughs> what if you had to introduce yourself? You couldn't, uh, you couldn't include your degree or your job title, right? So that includes a postdoc. You can't include that. You can't include your discipline, right? Your science, your scientific subject. You can't include that. And you can't include anything about your specific dissertation or your specific, you know, uh, research subfield. Can't do that. What would you say about yourself, right? What would you say about, hi, I'm Brenda. I'm the person in the lab who my colleagues know me as uh, the woman who's always up for, right? Like whatever, right? Like what would you say about yourself? And then, of course, you can add back in the specific kind of academic scientific stuff. But that is a really great way. I'm getting excited. (laughs) The people that say to me, like, but Jen, I'm the same as all the other postdocs in the lab. Like, no, right? Like, obviously, no, but like, for real, right? So this intro is a great way of um, being specific about how you're not. So that was exercise number one. The second exercise, and I have folks in my program do this. And this is once you do those different self-reflection exercises that I mentioned briefly, The last step is I have folks put together what I call a focus statement. And that it's like 10 sentences of like prompts where you just fill in the blanks with different words. And that it doesn't necessarily tell you the specific types of jobs and the specific types of employers, but it helps give a shape. It helps give a shape to the kind of job and career you want. So that when you go out into the world and you read job ads and you talk to people and you listen to career panels, et cetera, You can start to say like, oh, does this fit me? Does this fit me? Right. So that I think is really powerful for people. Absolutely. I I think it's, it's fundamental. There's so much in there I want to follow up on. Um, You you started off by talking about the, you know, what, what kind of money do you want to make? What kind of, where do you want to live? Um, Those sorts of things. And I know for me, I had a baby when I was halfway through my PhD. I started my PhD a little later than probably most people do, um, which put me right at the time where I was ready to start a family right in the middle. And uh, we can talk a whole episode on what that does to your PhD. But um, in the end, it it was a big factor because we, I, my husband had a full-time career in, in Vancouver. We knew we didn't want to move. I had, there's two universities in Vancouver. I'd already done my degree at one of them. And that left the other one, which is where I was looking for postdoc. But I sort of knew that if we, if I did this, I was on that train, I was still on the train, you know, you can only step off at certain points, I think. And, uh, 
and I'd pro- we'd probably have to move, which is not something we wanted to do. I also wanted to keep building my family. And so those were two two big factors that went into my decision. Um, but I won't say that that decision didn't come with guilt. Um, I had put a lot of time and a lot of people had put a lot of time into me. Um, I'd put a lot of money <laughs> into my career and I, and I have to, into my training. And I have to say that the expectation from my committee, my advisor was a wonderful, wonderful person, but I, I think would have liked to see me continue with the research I had started in his lab. Um, it was a really nice opportunity, a really well, like a really good fit, um, the opportunity I was looking at. And because of that, I I actually made the decision probably six or eight months before I told anybody about the decision because I was, I was scared to admit it. Um, and I didn't have a job lined up. That's the other thing. The job came later. So I was stepping off the train into nothing. And that was terrifying. Um, so I, I don't know if there's something there you can speak to, but I think that's probably really, really common. Um, maybe more so for women. I'm not sure. Um, but what what do you do when people come to you with that kind of distress? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks for sharing. And I'm sorry that you experienced that. And I know folks listening can't see us, but I was, I was nodding the whole time because I lived through like my version of that. Absolutely. I sometimes say to folks, I felt like a complete asshole by not applying for academic jobs <laughs> because of that guilt. Mm-hmm. Like I'm single. I don't have kids. I could move anywhere. Why? I should be. I should be. Anyways, I'm ranting. Yeah, so absolutely. I think it's very common. And this is what uh, connects PhDs across disciplines. Of course, everyone's going to have a different you know, experience here, but that is a really common uh, ac- across all PhDs in different countries and disciplines, et cetera. Um, I think it is really, really helpful to get clearer to get clarity around like who you are and what's important to you. Cause Nicole, you said like, it was a great fit, but actually it wasn't. It was a great research fit. It was, it it made so much sense for the research path. But it wasn't a great fit for who you were then and who you wanted to be going forward. And so just reminding yourself of that and being in community with other people who are also making those choices, hard choices, who are wrestling with those choices, I think is super helpful So another practical thing, you know, in addition to the self-reflection stuff and kind of continuing to like be in touch with yourself, that actually networking as a form of self-care, this might sound super weird, right? But doing informational interviews, building your community, getting to know people in like outside of that specific research trajectory, because those people who made different choices, they're going to probably get it. And when people are interested in your career and see strengths in you and perceive you as like a potential colleague of theirs in a different domain and like listen to you and like answer your questions and give you time for me and for a lot of my clients over the years, that's really affirming. It's so affirming. And so it takes work right on your own self-reflection and to build that community, but it just helps to kind of take the place of all of those feelings of guilt and shame and what ifs and I invested so much money and time it's like it doesn't that's not that's not who I am that's not what I want that's not like what it what it's going to take for me to make the impact that I actually truly want to make going forward and it's not because young me future me sucked but sorry past me it's not that past me sucked past me had different goals different priorities and it's okay that I now have different ones because all all of this stuff as long as you're not actively making the world a worse place is all created equal and you get to pick yeah yeah I I I just before passing it back to Brenda I just want to follow up on on what you said um in terms of you know build that community and and go out and seek other people and i certainly did do that and it and it was hard it was it it took it took guts to do it but that's just one of the reasons why we're offering this podcast because i think that i think it's it's hard to find those people sometimes and it's hard to have those conversations cuz there you know it's been a while since i was in the academic world but i still think that it's probably 
the vibe, the expectation is still sort of there that you're going to continue where you, you know, on the path you started. So, so I hope this provides a resource for people and, and, and gives people the, um, at least some connection if it's, even if it's virtually with strangers. Brenda, I'd love for you to talk. Let's, let's, you know, we've, we've gone back into the negative around postdocs and I'd love for you to talk about the positive stuff again, because it's, it's not all negative. No, for sure. I think, um, coming back to like in the, the original conversation about the the, the good of, of a postdoc and the idea of you becoming like starting from point a in which you're not super sure about your research and then getting to point b in which you'll be you feel maybe you already are you already are independent researcher but uh if you have some level of humility you will probably feel the need to always improve and having the opportunity to, to do that is definitely a, a plus. Uh, I, I I do think that the kind of work group that you are in, the lab, the, your 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 uh, supervisor, or maybe in this case your advisor, I think it would be a better uh, if you if you find the the right um, what's the word the right allies uh, that will help you and also build or a network within the, the academic. Um, environment in which you are in I think that's super important and and I also uh, and you mentioned that in the same way you can find yourself surrounded by people that see a potential and uh, and if it aligns with your values it can be very nice it can be that transition in between feeling you just finished your PhD you basically to some extent unless you are a very exceptional PhD student you basically follow through a project that was mostly initiated by your supervisor and then you kind of and then at this time you have more uh the chance of showing what you actually want what what is actually your 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 interest your academic interest and then finding people seeing you do that work and and if they respond well that can be extremely satisfying and can be a great experience uh so i think that that's that's very nice is a postdoc, can it just be, instead of a means to an end, can it be a job in itself? I mean, I know it's a it's not something you can do forever, but maybe that's another way to look at it because it sounds like, you know, there's some fun stuff in there, even though you may not want the end the end result that, or may not be able to achieve the end result if there's only so many academic positions. Well, I, I think that, yeah, but I don't think that job will be called postdoc because I think a postdoc has this kind of already the name is sounds transitional. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I think uh, this there's this missing position that, that a lot of people are talking about all the time. You find people saying, where is the research, you know, the I don't want to say research assistant, but where is our staff researcher uh, in this group? Why don't we have more people that just do research uh, for yeah, they just carry on projects. But I think and I think this was something that uh, Jen mentioned this is how the system has been designed, was designed 80 years ago. I don't know when, like that's when the NIH started thinking how we cannot just give money, you know, nearly willy like we used to. It looks like we have to start getting some accountability. So we're going to make some kind of career advancement tool. So we know how much money we can give to each person. And we have some way of allocating these resources. And I think that's kind of, I think the problem with a postdoc is that if you just like to do research, but you don't want to necessarily be the head of the lab, it's really hard because that position has an expiration date. Mm -hmm. And if you're a postdoc for 12 years, people are going to, you know, are going to raise some eyebrows it's because we don't give the research, uh, yeah, uh, staff researcher a position. Let me respond a couple different uh, things. Well, the first thing is, let me emphasize that this self-reflection that I'm talking about and doing that intro exercise, if you want to take me up on that challenge and, you know, putting together your version of the focus statement, that is great work for folks to do, even if, you know, they're in a PhD program and they're not finishing anytime soon. They're in a postdoc and it's awesome. You know, just do that work because in theory, in theory, uh, you can you can help shape the work that you do now, the role that you have now, into the kind of role that is going to help you build the skills that you need if you need to build new skills, right? Meet the people that you need to meet if you need to build that network in a certain direction, right? The more you know about who you are and the kind of career you have, 
the more you can start shaping the work that you do now to better align with what comes next, right? So that's, it's not just that you have to do self-reflection as a punishment, right? If you decide to leave academia, this is for everything, everyone. So that was the first thing I wanted to mention. The second thing I wanted to mention is I just got an email from a client, a, a client I had a few years back, and this was somebody who was a research associate. So at least certainly in a Canadian context, that research associate, they sort of made up that second tier. It's like a second tier postdoc, the super postdoc. You age out, you experience out of postdoc. Okay, now you get to be a research associate, maybe a little bit more money, but it also there's like an end date too. And he was really struggling. He was a research associate for like a more than a decade. And I just got an email from him three days ago. I am enjoying my new academic adjacent life. He works at a university, but not as a researcher, which is a lot of my favorite things about academia without being an academic anymore, right? So just to say that you can go in lots of different directions. And of course, the reality is that postdocs go in lots of different directions after that. So there's, you don't have to like fall into the, oh, I have to be a professor after this or else it was a complete waste of time. Like, that's just not helpful. <laughs> right? Like, Let's not do that. I'm going to pivot a little bit and and ask a question about postdocs in general. So I've, I've heard that postdocs are diversifying in themselves. We talked about how careers beyond postdocs are diversifying maybe and, and or should. Um, but I've heard of things like industry postdocs. So maybe you can give us and any sort of insight into how the actual postdoc is evolving. Yeah, absolutely. It's really, really interesting. And <laughs> I think the politics, uh, the policies around these are interesting, but there certainly are different types of postdocs. Um, there are industry postdocs, as you said, and there are postdocs that have like totally different types of defined roles. Like people are teaching postdocs or you're the knowledge mobilization postdoc, right? Or you're an EDI uh, postdoc, an equity, diversion and inclusion postdoc, right? So you're not actually doing science in the lab, even though you have a science background. So there's different kinds of postdocs, which in theory are going to help train you for different types of career paths. So for sure, be open to all of that stuff. It's, it's interesting. I got rants about this, but anyways, let's keep it positive. Yeah, I know at Stem Cell, we have some postdocs who are doing, you know, partial research time or full-time research time here uh, in industry. So I think that is expanding and and hopefully preparing people for careers, you know, beyond, uh, beyond academ academia. Yeah, I think here also in Europe, um, especially the large uh, pharmaceutical companies, for example, they have these training programs, postdoctoral fellowships of like two to three years. And they usually, uh, so I know companies like Roche have the Novartis uh, and other large um, companies that because they have a very, uh, a very uh, uh, developed R and D uh, in house, they actually have a lot of expertise to for a scientist to do research work within the company. But at the same time, uh, they get trained in all aspects of the company and I and then they can decide whether at the end of their training whether they want to continue in R&D or maybe they want to go to some other strategic um, path within the company and I think that's really nice because uh, oftentimes you want people that understand kind of if you have such a company that are very strong in research and development you want people across their different departments to understand what research and development means mm -hmm. so that's mm -hmm. and i know that this, those programs are very popular um uh, here as well and, and very interesting options for for recent graduates or soon to be graduates yeah, absolutely so I don't know uh, if you've read this article, Jennifer, but I'm sure you know the the trend. There's this article in Nature called Where Have All the Postdocs Gone? And uh, it seems to be, that, and I've seen this on Twitter too, I've seen a lot of academics saying, I, I have all these postdoc positions in my lab and I can't get anyone applying. And so something is changing. My question is, what is the impact going to be on on science? Because those postdocs are highly productive researchers. Um, and and so maybe, I don't know if you have an answer to the question, where have all the postdocs gone? But also, what does that mean and what has to change um, so that we don't end up actually impacting discovery? Yeah, it's interesting. So I'm totally the wrong person to ask that specific question about. Uh, it's obviously very complicated. 
uh, you know, there's lots of different giant institutions and governments and all of that involved here. Um, you know, my personal, my my the what I personally care about. Obviously, I care about science. I care about the the scientific enterprise. You know, give me all the latest vaccines immediately, right? Like, <laughs> thank you so much, all of the above. But I personally, I personally can help individuals. Right. I personally can help individuals. And that's what I want to remind people. Like science is going to exist with or without you. And there, it doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help anybody for you to be miserable, for you to not make enough money to live, for you to live on a different continent from the people you love. You know, if you don't want to do that, if you do want to do that, okay, fun. But <laughs> right, this doesn't help anybody. You got to take care of you and yours first and that doesn't mean you got to be selfish it doesn't help anybody for you to be miserable so like do not be a martyr to science is what i'll say i think brenda can speak to the moving the moving continents piece well i in my case i also moved not only for the position but also to improve my personal situation i i, I always wanted to move to europe so um so I would say, even I would say science was an excuse. Uh, I always wanted to, to move across the Atlantic and um, science was the obvious. And I always like science, so I figure, well, why can't one one uh, aim serve the other? But I, I, I do That's think... the kind of selfishness I love. <laughs> I love that selfishness. Yeah, you know, I, I came here from the from, from the south to, to beautiful weather of Amsterdam, but I, I I do think that especially uh, people like me with a kind of like migrated uh, for their careers or as you know adjacent to their careers, this idea of martyr, martyrdom on and you're kind of giving yourself for your career also because I I think sometimes that the thought comes to my mind is that if I came I mean if I did came all the way here I might as well do you know, do the most of it. Or if I'm not going to, if I've made the sacrifice of being away from my family, I, ha I this has to work. This has to be exceptional because otherwise, what am I doing here? For If I'm going to have a mediocre life, uh, it's, then I might as well go back to where I come from. But now, but I think that that's also very common, this idea that you have to give your all uh, because you already gave up so much. Uh, this fallacy, this sunken fallacy uh, situation. I see Jennifer. Jennifer's shaking her head at you, Brenda. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I have no, this. Right. this no, this is, but this is. I think you're speaking. You're speaking what a lot of what a lot of people who are facing this these decisions are thinking. So that's but exactly. It's, and it's totally wacky, right? Like if you actually listen to yourself, yeah, yeah. you actually you're like, what am I actually thinking here? I suffered, so I should continue to suffer. What? Yes, <laughs> like, that's ridiculous. Can we not do that, please? That sounds about right. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, I'm, 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 of course, I'm kind of exaggerating a little bit, but I think that's something that other people in my situation, and especially, uh, you know, immigrants uh, like me, you feel that you, you it's, that's an extra layer of, of complexity to your situation. Absolutely. We are almost out of time. I want to give Jennifer the the last word here. I'm sure you have something to add. What if you? What would you tell our listeners? Um, you know, sort of at the end of this conversation, if you could leave them with with a couple words or a couple pieces of advice. Yeah, I mean, let me repeat something I said just now. Like, be selfish. Be selfish. Right? It doesn't mean being a bad person. That's not my what I'm saying. Is like put yourself first for once, at least for ten minutes to start. Right. Put yourself first. And I promise you, if you do that, you can actually help make the world better in ways that you can, only you can. Science will continue. The research will continue. We don't live in an ideal world. You're not, you sacrificing is not going to make our world ideal. <laughs> right? But if you can identify your like secret sauce uh, to make the people around you better, to make the institutions around you better, like whatever it is that you can do, that is what you have control over. And that is like my final message, right? Just like put yourself first, be selfish, and then go and make our world more awesome. Because our world needs it. 
Science needs it. I think there are many ways to contribute to science and and it doesn't have to be at the bench. It doesn't have to be through that academic career, but it can be if that's what's calling to you. And and I think that I think that's an excellent way to end it. That concludes our episode for today. Thank you very much, Dr. Jennifer Polk. Please look her up. She's all over the internet. She has blogs, she has videos, um, or if you are looking for a career coach, you can seek her out. Don't forget to sign up for our email list at www.labcoatsandlifepodcast.com to get show notes, episode summaries, and links to useful information, or learn more about STEM mentorship via the resources found at www.stemcell.com slash labcoatsandlife. You can also reach out to us on Twitter via StemCell at StemCellTech or via email at info at labcoatsandlifepodcast.com with feedback or to suggest guests.